All right, good evening. I'd like to call the uh, April 24th, 2023 meeting of the Greenville City Council order. I'm Mayor P.J. Connolly. I'll be presiding over today's meeting. First, I'd like to call on Councilmember Blackburn for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening, everybody. I thought I would use this opportunity to just sort of bring us all back to uh, the idea of what re religion really can mean. I think religion often becomes kind of a source of conflict <coughs> around the world. It can be a conflict within families. And I think at heart, really, religion has so many benefits. If we, if we look at those benefits and what they can be, they can be things, uh, family uh, rituals, times we spend together, um, and order to our day. And I say that because this is my grandfather's Bible. And when I was a little, very little girl, he used to read the 23rd Psalm before breakfast every morning. It was just a small thing. It was just a ritual, but it gave my day kind of a framework and value. So I just thought I would throw the invocation tonight, read the 23rd Psalm, and this is the old fashioned King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. All right, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Mayor Connolly? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Glovers, let us know she will not be with us tonight. Council Member Daniels? Present. Council Member Blackburn? Present. Council Member Smiley? Here. Council Member Robinson? Here. Council Member Bell? Here. All right, Mayor Connolly, you have a quorum. All right, thank you very much. We'll move on to the approval of tonight's agenda. Madam Manager, any recommended changes? Mayor, I have no changes on the agenda right. tonight. To I this. would like to add a special recognition for a very special guest we have here tonight. We have to approve as revised. Second. All right, motion has been made by Councilmember Smiley, second by Councilmember Blackburn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say nay. Motion passes 5 0. And I believe your motion said that it was going to come right after the public comment period, right? Yes, it did. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll move on to the public comment period. The uh, public comment period is a period reserved for comments by the public. Items that were or scheduled to be the subject of a public hearing conducted at the same meeting or another meeting during the same week shall not be discussed. A total of 30 minutes is allocated with each individual being allowed no more than three minutes. Individuals who register with the city clerk to speak will speak in the order register until the allotted 30 minutes expires. If time remains after all persons who have registered have spoken. Individuals who did not register will have an opportunity to speak until the allotted 30 minutes expires. Madam Clerk, our first speaker. Yes, sir. our first speaker is Mr. Henry Hotstetler. Mr. Hotstetler, you have three minutes to address the mayor and council. Hello, city council. My name is Henry Hotstetler. I'll try not to repeat too much of what you heard at the last meeting. Um, but if you're like me, I need to hear things five or ten times. At least that's what my wife says. So, I thank you for serving your community. I know you would not be here if you did not care about the community in which you live, and I sincerely thank you for that. I'm here because I care about Greenville, and I know you've heard a lot of folks express their disappointment about the loss of tennis courts at Elm Street. I also disagree with the loss of tennis courts there at Elm Street. The courts that have been there since the early 60s it would have been nice to have been heard before the decision had already been made, but nevertheless, you know, tennis has been a good, quiet friend to Greenville. Now it feels like the city is saying goodbye to a tried and true friendship and trading it in for the next new thing. Just three years ago, the city said goodbye to the two West Greenville tennis courts. You heard Rose High tennis coach Marvin Hardy address the council last at the last meeting. Marvin volunteered there for 40 years, and he mentioned nearly 1,000 juniors passed through those courts. 
I got to know Marvin traveling with him to New York City to the U.S. Open over 30 years ago. What a great role model he is for those kids. He didn't tell you what he didn't tell you was that many of those kids he taught in West Greenville received scholarships in North Carolina Central, North Carolina A&T, Federal State, Johnson C. Smith, and other CIAA schools. He also did not tell you that he received the Greenville Recreation Department Volunteer Award over 25 years ago. He got that. When those courts were taken, he quietly, quietly went elsewhere and is teaching tonight at Rose High Courts, which is why he's not here. The West Greenville courts are sorely missed. I know Greenville is known for baseball, but I always chuckle when the Little League Championships come to Elm Street Park or the National Girls Softball Tournament comes here. There's a two-week celebration all over the news because 250 to 300 players are coming to Greenville and have such an economic impact, which is great. Well, guess what's coming to Greenville? And again, in two weeks, which could very well be the last. Just a ho-hum 600 players for the second year in a row. And of course, this does not include the over 500 players, parents and coaches attending the junior team tennis last summer. It just feels like the city's loyal, quiet friend for over 60 years has been discarded for the current popular trend That's of time. the day. It seems to me the council has two choices, do nothing and hang the old friend out to dry or form a task force with ECU to open up a new tennis complex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hosseller. Madam Clerk, our next speaker. Yes, sir. Next speaker is Mr. Ronald Vincent. Mr. Vincent, you've got three minutes to address the mayor and council. <clears throat> Thank you, and it's good to see you again. Uh, usually it's a good day when I have to walk in here, isn't it? Because we've done something good. And, and I said then, and I'll say now, so much of it is because what y'all do for the city of Greenville and the Recreation and Parks Department. Most of what we have accomplished comes because of that. Uh, we go travel all over the state, go to uh, clinics everywhere, and people are so envious of what we have in Greenville. They're so envious. Man, how do y'all keep it going? The ravages of travel ball and what it's done to uh, city programs it, all over the country. It's just, you know, people travel and don't play in the local rec, and, it, and it's killing. And we've been able to maintain. We've been able to maintain. And people are so envious, and they tell us all the time, golly, how do y'all keep it going? And I tell them the same thing. Our city council and our recreation department keeps it going. They want it, they make it so we can do things. And, 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 I, and we really appreciate it. And Greenville Bay Ruth now, which is going to be affected here shortly, Greenville Bay Ruth has four prep league teams. We have 13 Bay Ruth teams, not all from Greenville, some from around the county. And we have six senior Bay Ruth teams. So we have 20 some teams that we deal with in the summertime. Now, that's over 250 people that we deal with almost every night, you know, playing ball, doing this, because we have the ability to do it. Uh, so we have players, and it's not so much progressive as, as good players, we're keeping them busy, we're doing things, we're saving our children, is what, the bottom line is what we're all about, we're saving our children, and, and uh, we need to keep that. Now, CPL is gonna talk with us, and, and, and we have worked out a good agreement with them, but we cannot let Pitt County Bay Ruth go. It has to continue to strike. Won the national championship last year, 15 year olds. First time uh, North Carolina team that ever won it. We won the national championship, beating teams from California, Florida, you know, all over the country, obviously. Uh, so we have to maintain our Bay Ruth program. It, we can't let it slip away. Travel ball is, you know, is, yeah, you, you can play travel ball because, you, you know, if you don't play, you can go to another team tomorrow. You know, so, and it, it, it's killed recreation programs throughout, throughout the country. And, and when we travel around the country, we hear it all the time. So just wanted to say thank you for what you've done in the past. 
Thank you, recreation people, for what you have done. And y'all are the reason. Y'all have given us a chance to do this. And I thank you, and let's do it right. right. Let's get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Vincent. Coach, thank you for all your decades of service to the community. Thank you. Thank you. I had him as a player a long time. It's amazing you're still coaching. <laughs> and I, I'm getting old, Coach. What does that say? You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate you in more ways you can ever, I can ever tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Uh, we do not have any additional registered speakers. I don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. <laughs> All right. Anyone else like to speak during the public comment period? Please come forward. State your name for the record. You have three minutes. All right. Seeing none. Close public comment period. We'll move on to the recognition. Come on, Les. Pitch, you have to squat down yeah. <laughs> All right. Tonight we'd like to take a couple minutes to recognize J.H. Rose High School baseball coach Ronald R. V. Vincent. <laughs> on, on Tuesday, April 11th, Coach Vincent added to his high school baseball coaching legacy by earning his 1,000th career win in the sport. With the victory, Coach Vincent became the first coach in any sport in the history of North Carolina high school athletics to reach 1,000 career wins. Now in his 51st season, Coach Vincent's teams have averaged nearly 20 wins a season under his watch and earned seven state championships along the way. For those of you who know Coach Vincent, you know that he will be the first one to credit all the players he has had throughout the years, but he will. What we wanted to take a moment tonight to put him in the spotlight and congratulate him on his recent accomplishment that may never be matched. Congratulations, Coach Vincent. figured Les would probably be pretty good arguing balls and strikes. Uh, yeah. 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 Ronald, that was a, Ronald, that was a, that was a ball. That was, that's, 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 that's a ball. I'm following this brief. <laughs> All right. We'll move on now to the consent agenda, Madam Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The consent agenda includes the following item. Authorization to purchase 46 replacement vehicles and equipment for various city departments and a resolution declaring a surplus and authorizing the disposition of a, by electronic auction of 46 vehicles and equipment being replaced. Item two is a contract award to Street Level Media, LLC, for transit advertising <coughs> services. And item three are various tax refunds greater than $100. All right. Councilmember Blackburn. I would like to remove, and we may discuss this on item, further on item five, but I'd like to remove item two from the consent agenda just to get a little bit more information. Certainly. Move to approve the remaining items. Second. All right, motion was made by Councilmember Smiley, second by Councilmember Blackburn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 5-0. Item number two. Item number two is a contract award to Street Level Media <coughs> LLC for transit advertising services. Kevin Mulligan, Public Works Director, is available <coughs> for questions. Um, Mr. Mulligan, thank you so much. Is this a new company? It is not. No, this is the company that actually is doing it for us right now. 
And maybe we will talk about this on number five, but do we have guidelines? We do, and we will. <coughs> and then I guess my last question is, um, do we have uh, sort of a, a, an allotment for PSA type announcements? I know a lot oh, That's of a good question. In the policy, we talk about um, PSA, but we do not have a specified allotment. <coughs> because I don't know if that's, um, you know, true. I know that most media used to have a certain percentage of their airtime devoted to PSA type advertising. It'd, it'd be nice if we did something like that. Yeah, we. Yeah, to, to be honest, we just we have not been contacted uh, that often. But that may be street level, right? There's there's a fee <coughs> for that for all this advertising. So, but certainly we can uh, have that discussion. PSA and uh, nonprofits, um, that sort of thing. It, okay. it is important to point out that these are wraps that are on the sides of buses. So as Mr. Mulligan pointed out, there is a cost to um, um, producing the wrap and the application of the wrap on the bus. True. And, and be happy to talk about that in just a little bit. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, with that, uh, move to approve. Second. All right, motion made by Councilmember Blackford, second by Councilmember Bell. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 5 0. We'll move on to item number four, Madam Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Item number four is a big item for the City of Greenville. It's a contract award for the Build Grant, which includes a Fifth Street reconstruction <coughs> streetscape project for contract award for Build Greenway project and the contract award for the Build um, Task Order for Construction Engineering Inspections <coughs> and Material Testing. I'll call, call forward um, Civil Engineer 3, Lynn Rayner, for that presentation. Lynn? Thank you, Madam City Manager. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Good evening. Council. <clears throat> so, we're, we are going to talk about the contract awards that uh, Madam City Manager just mentioned. It's just for the build grant. Thank you. We'll just move right on through that. Uh, so back in uh, early 2019, uh, the city uh, applied uh, to the Federal Highway Administration for a build grant um, uh, that's managed by the USDOT, uh, better utilizing investment to leverage development. Um, always has to be a, a beautifully named acronym, acronym for any uh, grant program. Uh, later that fall, in November of 2019, we received a uh, notification that we were going to receive uh, that grant. Uh, so here we see there are seven projects that make up uh, the city's build grant project. Uh, this is an overall map uh, showing where uh, the different components are laid out across the city. Uh, through the middle of the map, uh, the blue, represents uh, West 5th Street phases two, three, and four. Those are streetscape projects. And then around the periphery, the green, are the Greenway and multi-youth path projects. Uh, this is just to give everyone a sense of how the build grant projects tie in with other projects that were either underway at the time of application uh, or uh, have been completed since then or maybe even underway at this time. Uh, because again, the, the, the premise of the build grant was to, uh, to fund projects that were being, uh, you know, uh, built, uh, you know, in the, in the area, uh, and to increase, uh, connectivity. So with that, uh, we're going to move into talking about our greenway projects, uh, again, around the periphery of that previous map. Uh, what we have here is Project A, the South Tar River Greenway, Phase 3B. Uh, many of you are familiar with Phase 3A that uh, should wrap up construction within the next uh, four to six weeks. Uh, it is off the top of the map. Uh, phase 3B uh, begins uh, where that project ends, uh, runs underneath the Memorial Drive Bridge in the upper left portion of the map. Uh, that is a location where the path will actually be at grade with the river, uh, and it's one of the only locations where we will actually have <coughs> a greenway that is at grade uh, at the river. will provide a, a beautiful uh, view of the river. Uh, the project continues down uh, adjacent to uh, the Moywood uh, development, provides a connection to that development in the lower left part of your screen, continues past the VA clinic at the bottom uh, on along Moy Boulevard, to the intersection of Moy Boulevard and 5th Street in the lower right portion of your screen. Uh, this is a 10-foot 
asphalt multi-use path. Um, as I mentioned, it provides a connection to the Moywood neighborhood, uh, the VA clinic, uh, and along the way it will construct a couple of hundred feet of boardwalk as well as a 70-foot pedestrian bridge. Uh, the next section we will discuss is in the lower left. That is the Moy Boulevard multi-use path. Uh, this project picks up uh, at the top part of the screen where uh, phase 3B uh, that we just discussed leaves off the intersection of uh, Moy Boulevard and 5th Street. Uh, the, the path will come along uh, Moy Boulevard, uh, turn down Farm Drive, Venture Tower, Cine, uh, drive and then make a connection down at the lower right part of the screen at Stantonsburg and Memorial Drive. Um, I do want to point out uh, in the upper right part of the screen, um, it, you see Sharrows there. Uh, the section along Moy Boulevard uh, will be Sharrows uh, for use by bicyclists and then pedestrians will actually use the existing sidewalk along Moy Boulevard until uh, you get to Farm Drive where that will construct as you see with the other graphic here, an eight-foot uh, concrete uh, path uh, to connect out to the intersection of uh, Stansburg and Memorial Drive, where that will connect uh, to the uh, multimodal transportation improvements that were completed with the 10th Street Connector Project. The next section we will discuss is the uh, Arts District Trail in the lower right portion of your screen. Uh, the 10th Street Connector Project that I just mentioned provides uh, connectivity uh, for bicyclists and pedestrians between this project and the Moy Boulevard project we just saw a minute ago. So here we have Project F. Uh, it is a connection between Dickinson Avenue, 10th Street on the left part of the screen, and Ficklin Street down at the uh, lower right part of the screen. Uh, it is a 10-foot um, multi-use path, asphalt path. Uh, that makes use of the existing railroad bed. Um, also, uh, off to the left part of the screen would be uh, the eventual Intersect East that I think everyone is familiar with. Uh, these improvements will, however, stop on the, uh, the north side of 10th Street, and the reason for that is to allow flexibility in how the future in Intersect East con connects with these improvements, and you can see uh, before and after uh, rendering there on the uh, left part of the screen. So the last Greenway project that we'll talk about is the Town Common Connector in the upper right portion of the screen. Uh, that uh, runs between 5th Street and 1st Street. So a little orientation, this map has turned 90 degrees, so uh, north and the river is off to the right portion of the screen. ECU and 5th Street is off to the left. Uh, the project begins uh, near the, the noted century trees uh, north of 5th Street and will uh, construct a 10-foot wide concrete path uh, from that location. Uh, and what we see here to 3rd Street, uh, the next section will be in the next slide. Uh, this section does include a uh, 16 by 20 uh, foot pavilion pictured in the upper right portion of your screen. Uh, that will actually include a, a, an educational kiosk uh, that can be used as an outdoor classroom. It will also include a storage unit for approximately 30 folding chairs and six six foot tables uh, to facilitate that outdoor use. Here's the second portion of Project G Town Common Connector, uh, Third Street on the left portion of your screen. Uh, it does provide a connection uh, at the currently cul-de-sac East Second Street uh, for residents that live along Second Street. Uh, then it continues towards First Street with uh, some boardwalk and then a uh, crosswalk, a striped crosswalk with a median island uh, to connect over to Town Common Park and actually the South Tar River Greenway that's off to the right portion of the screen. So with that, we'll talk a little bit about our streetscape projects. Um, again, the streetscape projects are the blue down the middle of the screen. Um, they are labeled phases two, three, and four. They begin at Cadillac Street on the left-hand end, which is the west end, uh, and they head through uh, West Greenville, uh, through uh, the downtown area to uh, Reed Street on the right portion of the screen, uh, the eastern portion of the screen. Uh, we call it streetscape, but it's a lot more than just streetscape. 
uh, we're constructing uh, two roundabouts, which are noted by the blue bullseyes uh, on your screen. We're reconstructing uh, much of the existing street. So new pavement, new curb and gutter, new sidewalks. Um, we're improving the stormwater infrastructure through this uh, section. Uh, we're replacing signal mast arms at the intersections of Evans Street and Reed Street. And we are undergrounding all of the utilities along the blue portion that you see. Much of what's uptown is already, uh, actually all of what's uptown is already underground, but that entire section along uh, West Greenville uh, and through the intersection there at the second roundabout at Elizabeth Street, all of that will be underground. So it's going to provide a much cleaner view shed as you're traveling along and walking and biking along those sections. Uh, all of these improvements that we're about to discuss are all guided by the Center City West Greenville uh, Streetscape Master Plan. Uh, the streetscape part includes brick crosswalks at major intersections, uh, decorative roadway and pedestrian scale lighting, decorative street signposts, brick neighborhood markers, landscaping, and pub public gathering places at the roundabouts. So phase two uh, picks up where phase one actually was completed at Cadillac Street uh, about 12 years ago. Um, continues through the intersection of Tyson Street uh, just to the east of that intersection. The existing intersection you see up in the upper left portion of the screen, so the roundabout that's going to be constructed at that intersection is going to make that much safer for not only vehicles but uh, pedestrians and, and bicyclists as well. Provides the public plazas that you see there with the grassed areas, nice landscaping um, and the brick crosswalks. It also includes, if you look at the bottom portion of the screen, uh, we have five foot striped bike lanes uh, through this section. That's going to narrow the existing pavement width, slow down traffic, and provide a, um, a striped area for a cyclist uh, to use through the corridor. So phase three uh, picks up, obviously, uh, where phase two leaves off, um, just east of Tyson Street. Again, similar, I'm not going to go through all of the amenities again, but similar amenities will continue through this section. Uh, what you see here is the first half of those uh, improvements as we head uh, from left to right across the screen, uh, screen towards downtown. Uh, this is the, uh, the roundabout here is the intersection of Elizabeth and 5th Street. Uh, so again, uh, you know, lower left portion of the screen, that's the existing intersection. Today, uh, I'm sure you can see that the roundabout is going to tremendously clean up that intersection, provide a much safer movement, uh, slow down some traffic. Uh, provide, uh, again, grassed plazas uh, for public gathering places, landscaping, uh, brick crosswalks. Uh, again, decorative lighting. Uh, in the lower, I will say, in the lower uh, right portion of the roundabout, uh, due to the topography, there is going to be a, a very nice uh, brick retaining wall, uh, which will have some up lighting for a portion of it uh, to, uh, to, for others to coordinate some, some wall art at some point in the future. So that'll be a nice addition for the area. Uh, I, before moving on, I do want to point out also uh, to the right uh, of the roundabout there heading in to uh, the downtown area. The pavement width does narrow uh, pretty, uh, pretty well in this section. So uh, we had to switch from uh, stripe bike lanes to sharrows uh, as we move towards the downtown area in order to not, uh, to not impact the properties uh, through that section. And finally, our last uh, streetscape uh, section is the section in the downtown area from Pitt Street on the left portion of the screen to uh, Reed Street uh, on the right. Um, you know, again, similar uh, you know, streetscape amenities, reconstruction. This section does include uh, some narrow uh, concrete medians to help slow traffic. Uh, lighting consistent with other uh, decorative lighting that you see downtown, the brick crosswalks that you see here at Pitt Street, Evans Street, and Reed Street, um, and uh, you know, continues off to uh, the right uh, to connect to the ECU main campus. Uh, I will point out in the rendering in the upper right, uh, we are uh, maintaining the existing on-street parking. Uh, we have some uh, 
curb extensions there, the landscaped curb extensions, uh, which will beautify the area and help protect uh, that existing uh, on-street parking, as well as shorten those crosswalks. So, <clears throat> three years of plan development. It's taken a long time to get here. Uh, there's been a lot of moving parts along the way uh, and a lot of work by many, many people. Uh, Kimley Horn and their project director, Dan Robinson, uh, has driven a team of, of eight subconsultants that you see here on the right portion of the screen. There's been a lot of coordination uh, amongst that team. Uh, City of Greenville uh, staff with engineering, public works, planning and development services, recreation and parks, uh, city attorney's office, city manager's office. Um, there's been a lot of coordination, other agencies, agencies you see here, and all of that we had to, to accomplish through a pandemic. Learning a different way to work, working from home, trying to figure out how we could garner public input. A um, lot of obstacles to overcome, but uh, we're certainly happy to see uh, where we are today. So, what we're here to really discuss are the construction contracts. Uh, we have two construction contracts, as you see here, Fifth Street Reconstruction and Streetscape Project uh, that will take approximately three and a half years. The Greenways Project, four locations, uh, the multi-use paths will take approximately three years to complete. Both of those, the low bidder was Trader Construction. Uh, now, that name should sound familiar to you. Engineering and others have significant uh, experience with Trader Construction. They constructed the Town Creek Culvert, little project that we had running, you know, for a few years, uh, and did a very nice job with that, uh, as well as they are also uh, completing within the next uh, four to six weeks our annual stormwater repairs contract. So we have a lot of very positive experience with uh, Trader Construction and look forward to working with them on this project. Additionally, the third contract that Madam City Manager mentioned is the professional services contract with Kimley Horn and Associates to provide uh, CEI services uh, as you see here. And with that, uh, you see our recommendation to uh, award the three contracts. Any questions? Councilmember Blackburn. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, my screen is fritz. Um, uh, CEI, what does that stand for? Construction Engineering and Inspection. Okay, sort of the backup to the actual construction work that's going on. Yes, that, that they will, over, they will uh, provide daily project management. They will inspect. Uh, they will have inspectors on site recording uh, what's happening on the project, uh, verifying that proper materials are being brought to the project and, and that it's being uh, constructed in, in conformance with the plans and specifications. Okay. A um, couple of questions. The fifth, the one of the greenways goes right along the culvert. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. The town co town common connector. That's just going to be really nice. Um, what's a sharrow? A sharrow is a symbol that allows. Well, it signifies to motorized vehicle users that a cyclist um, the, to expect a cyclist in that lane. Sort of like arrow, but you better you, you better be ready to share. It's it, it's a shared arrow symbol. Okay, all right, good. Uh, that was just some terminology I wasn't familiar with. And then um, I saw uh, beside um, the project on Dickinson, there were some uh, there was going to be a path over there, and uh, it was right beside uh, some railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. Do the railroad tracks get subsumed by the greenway, or are they still going to be visible? The rail the rails will actually be taken up to install the greenway. Oh, okay. Um, I know there's a lot of rails to trails, and sometimes you get to sort of keep that authentic element of the rails. But we did like not we here. did talk about that during the design, but it wasn't something we were able to work out with this project. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Any other questions? I just got two um, real quick ones. Uh, the renderings of the uh, connector with uh, the old rail spur. Mm -hmm. um, whoever did the renderings thought that the graffiti was bad looking as well because they took it out. Can we make sure that, I know it's a private building, um, can we work with someone in the like mural community or art community to get that you know, fixed up? I, I, I'm sorry. I'm it's in the rendering. It's uh, the one he showed with the rail spur connection. The rendering. I think, yeah, are, are you referring to the graffiti that's on the dumpster? Yeah, the dumpster and there was some on the building that they okay. added out as well. 
Oh, well, we can certainly. I know it's super nitpicky, uh, but if you look at it, I mean, oh, edit it okay. out because it's clearly yeah. not like, you know, just right. doesn't look good. We can certainly do that. Yep. And then. Um, I, I, I do know that the dumpster is actually owned by Tony, Tony's Automotive, and they've been notified that they'll need to move that. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then the uh, the other question is, you know, curb cuts, I've asked about them a million times. Curb cuts, I've asked about them a million times. Like you can see in the Fifth Street resurfacing pro, um, renderings that there's like six alone in front of City Hall. Are we doing everything? You know, we've been working on this project for a long time. We're we doing everything we can to work with GUC to make sure all utility cuts that may be, you know, any repairs that may need to be done are being done ahead of time. At, at, to be the best of our ability. $3 million and have a bunch of patches in the middle you, of it. You, know, you are exactly second. right. And um, some of this work will have GUC going in first and rehabbing any water or sewer lines that okay. they would have. Right. We'll also do a bunch of um, che checking out all the storm water because our plan would be to pave this thing once and have it look good. Yeah. I know it doesn't always work out that way. Right, so I know. That's why I'm asking. I, yeah. All right, thank you. Councilmember Daniels. Phase two. So the bike lanes, what's the probability that they can be protected? We do not have the width to provide a protected bike lane. Uh, we, uh, with, with the five foot width, uh, we're already, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, if you look closely, though we're narrowing the existing travel lanes to 11 feet. Uh, we have, this is a significant bus route. And so in talking with transit, um, in, in in order for uh, their, basically the mirrors not to overhang into uh, you know, the adjacent uh, area. You know, we can't make those any narrower. We're, we're working within the existing um, curb line, mm -hmm. and so we, we just did not have the room to provide any type of um, physical barrier separation. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all, man. Any other questions? Move to approve the item. Second. Okay. Motion been made by Councilmember Smiley, second by Councilmember Bell. At one point, I just wanted to remind Council that the uh, approval of the bill grant is uh, subject to the Federal Highway Administration's approval. So just wanted to remind you all of that. Move to approve on their behalf. Second. Motion <laughs> been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember, I'm sorry, Councilmember Smiley, second by Councilmember Bell. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 5 0. Move on to yeah. item number five. If I could, I've got one more item to do, or not item, but one thing to. Just to say that I appreciate uh, Councilmember Daniels bringing up protected bike lanes. And I think that it's never, if we can't do it with this project, it's always good to talk about it. And hopefully as a community, to we'll work our way there. Great, thank you. All right, item number five. Mayor, one quick moment before we go to item number five. I would like to just take a moment to extend um, a heartfelt thanks to Lisa Kirby and Lynn Rayner. Lisa Kirby <laughs> and Lynn Rayner picked up this project in about November of 19 and they have lived and breathed this project and to get to this point and have dealt with everything that they have dealt with and gotten through a pandemic is remarkable and this is an extraordinary staff work and I think the city should be really proud that we are at this point and we owe much of this to Lisa and Lynn. Thank you all. Okay, next item. Um, is a discussion of the amendment to the transit advertising policy. Public Works Director Kevin Mulligan has that presentation. Kevin? Good evening, Council. Uh, All right. So, a little background is transit advertising policy established in uh, 2016. City Council approved it in October of 2016. Really the main goals were to maximize uh, revenue, ridership, and do that in a way, non-objectionable way as it, uh, as it relates to advertising uh, to our residents. So city staff researched what other cities had done and brought the policy to council for approval again in 2016. All right, Council Member Blackburn, you were asking about um, some of the advertising ABC, Street Level Media has been the firm that has been marketing the availability of advertising uh, space on city buses. Before you see a, um, a full wrap, a half wrap, um, what the marketing industry calls a King Kong wrap size and a Super Queen. So 
The um, contract we approved just a few minutes ago, uh, the full wrap is approximately $2,500 a month. The half wrap is $1,500 a month. King Kong's about $700 a month. If you, uh, so if you were to rent it for uh, one month, that would be the cost. If you do it for 12 months, it would be a reduced cost. All right, so street level media has had the advertising contract again since its inception. City has earned revenue in excess of 150,000. Uh, the contract was just approved. 53% of all revenue goes to the city. The street level gets 47% of that. Um, the source of revenue is used to reduce the local matching funds required for operations of transit. And how it works is street level media will submit to the city uh, potential advertising clients as well as their um, associated graphics with that advertisement. The city will evaluate that advertisement uh, for conformance with our policy. So in 2016, the policy approved by the city council prohibited the following items, uh, no political issues, no tobacco, alcohol, gambling, nothing disruptive to the operations of transit, uh, nothing depicting unsafe or illegal activity. Now illegal has very defined parameters. The word uh, unsafe is a broad one. So we've uh, tried to narrow that down somewhat. And here's what we look at, uh, potentially dangerous acts that would result in injury and can be identified with common sense and experience. That sounds overly cautious, but uh, certainly we're in an age where we have a TikTok blackout challenge or a Benadryl challenge, so we have some silly things out there. But so, if a submitted advertising campaign does not conform with the listed criteria above, it would be rejected. Uh, the applicant can then request the city to reconsider, and then Public Works, Transit, and the city attorney's office would uh, meet and collectively render a final decision. And if it was denied, uh, it would not be put on a city asset. All right. So for context, in the last six years, um, th there have been three items, three submissions at the city uh, that we've discussed with the city attorney's office. One of those items was approved, and two other items were reviewed and denied. So in the last six years, it's, it's really come up twice that we've rejected any items. So how do we compare to other cities? Um, the city is in line with most other cities in, in North Carolina. Alcohol, tobacco, political ads, um, explicit language, depictions of violence, all cities have a, a ban on advertisement for this. Unsafe and illegal, most or five out of seven have criteria for this. So do we have it right? Uh, this is what, the council's. What exactly is unsafe for an ad? So yeah, let's um, go back to that. It's so that's it's a broad term, and that's what we that's what I read that we try and. Okay, I get all of these, but not nothing particularly. I guess it, I think safety and is different for me. <laughs> well, he it, mentioned the Benadryl I can, challenge. I can, okay. kind of, I can cut to the chase and kind of explain why it. I put this on the agenda. So I was I got reached out to Brian Ritchie, who is one of our I think probably our largest. Mm -hmm. advertisers on one of the things and he presented one of his advertisements everybody's well aware that if you watch TV, stand on TV mm -hmm. Scott, he's standing on top of the truck right. it was denied by the city and so he asked me why it was denied from the city but he can do it down in Fayetteville and I guess gotcha. based off of that that okay. shows exactly why because they don't have a, a clause saying I guess unsafe, unsafe. unsafe. Okay. Well, unsafe okay. behavior so he's standing on, on a bus but we denied it because it's unsafe because we don't want everybody standing on buses and getting hurt. So <laughs> like, that's that's the whole purpose of why I asked for this to be up there and to see if the yeah comparing us to Fayetteville, there's two two um, two categories, two columns there. Uns they don't have an unsafe behavior clause or illegal activity, and illegal very defined, right? We we would reach out to police and they would tell us if it's illegal or not. Unsafe behavior again, that's a very broad um, term. So we've tried to define it as I described it before. Um, you know, injury um, through normal course of experience or common sense is there potential for injury. Okay. So, I mean, so just, are we in line with the rest of the communities? And I guess you can see that there's pretty close two other communities <coughs> that don't have unsafe behaviors so and we categorize it as unsafe behaviors, I guess. I think, Mayor, at this point, it's certainly up to the council about whether or not you all accept the policy or you want to make any tweaks. Well, I'm, I'm concerned. I mean, 
Best wants to stand you know, I've seen the, the artwork from Mr. Rich, and he sent it to me because he oh, reached out to me, and I'm like, you know, objectively, I've said going, you know, if you see all of his TV commercials and whatnot, his, his moniker, what he's known for is stand on top of this 18-wheeler. If you notice in the background, all the roads are blocked off and everything. And I mean, objectives, I don't, I don't think that depicts any unsafe conduct or anything, and that's what I'm worried about. I mean, I know we've got to have a standard, and it's kind of like uh, we all know it's, it's like uh, pornography. We all know what it is when we see it, but it's really hard to define it. And I don't, I mean, I just don't think that is, in my opinion, uh, depicts unsafe conduct because it's an advertisement for a personal injury firm. Um, that's my concern about it. And, you know, from a standpoint, I've seen, I've seen both the, the mock-ups of the two ads. And one of them looks like he's standing on top of the hood of an 18-wheeler. Um, and the other one looks like he's standing on, I guess, a car or something. But I don't see how that in and of itself it's when you immediately see it, you know what it is. He's advertising as a personal injury lawyer. Because uh, you see this everywhere you go. Uh, you see it even on traveling buses. You see it on electronic billboards. You see it on the TV. If you, I learned when I was sick a couple weeks ago, that I sat at home and I saw all these commercials coming on with all the personal injury lawyers. And one after the other, after the other, after the other was all, you know, advertisement. Uh, that's what my concern is. I mean, he's obviously been a really good steward of wanting to use our buses to advertise. And, um, I just well, I guess at his mock ups and I just don't see the, the problem with it. Well, I uh, you think know, the conversation is about a broad standard rather than a particular <laughs> item. But in defense of staff, you know, there's a difference in what you might put on TV and what you might put on the side of a bus, right? right? You know, it's uh, the something which on TV might not look. Uh, like you were suggesting something, but on the side of a bus, somebody standing on top of a vehicle, I don't know, it looks like it's, you know, possibly looks like an invitation to go stand on top of the bus. Um, I'm not saying that, I think that the conversation should be about the overall standard, <coughs> which I think seems fine. I don't know that we need to change the policy. We may want to reconsider the interpretation of some part of it, but. I agree. We've got to have a standard. That one standard that covers the broad base of activities we know would be harm. I get that. I'm, I'm with you, Council Member Smile. I'm with you on that. Absolutely. All right. Any other discussion? I guess the only item that I would add is what, what we were talking about earlier with some kind of um, uh, ratio for public service. Um, again, might not be a whole wrap because it's so costly, but some, it, some somehow integrating public service announcements nonprofit advertising into the bus advertising policy I think would be a nice touch for the city sends a really good message okay may I ask a question when they when the, the company they contract with when they do that is there a minimum period of time that they must contract with the company to to put the mock-up because I know that and that's a lot of effort to do all that wrap and then put it on the bus uh, so, there... so we have monthly rates six month and annual rates um, so you could do it for a month. I, I have not seen one done for a month. I think uh, we had like a vote for one one information. I think that was done like September, October, November, three months uh, for a period of time. But uh, um, typically we see six and 12 months. OK, I didn't know that the contracting company required a minimum of six months. They don't require it. Okay. You could do it for a month. You just pay more and they probably make less. So. Mm -hmm. I, I do think it's important to point out related to um, council member Blackburn that we do have uh, one of the um, the companies or places where that purchase advertising is the health department the health department has been um, has used bus advertising frequently to advertise programs and activities through the health department so we do have some public sector going ahead and paying the fee to get the advertising done i think yeah. we would have to talk to street level um, media who's doing who does this for us to understand what a nonprofit would look like maybe it's a reduced rate right but uh, but there is a cost this, uh, th there is a cost associated with this advertising because somebody has to make the wrap and install the wrap on the bus and i guess and and i appreciate that clarification i think what i'm thinking about is maybe it's not a full wrap maybe it's um, uh, someone, uh, attorney Les Robinson buys a full wrap and, um, you know, over here in the corner is, um, 
you know, please support uh, Children's Miracle Network hospitals or children's, right. um, you know. In other words, it, it, if, if it were possible, you know, it just, I think it'd be a really nice touch sure. for our advertising to incorporate yeah. some kind of public service. And I, and I show this slide because that's the bulk of the major advertising. There is advertising on the inside of the bus in smaller, smaller segments along the top of the bus. But um, we're happy to talk with them. Yeah. Okay. And is there advertisement on the um, covered bus shelters at all? And there's advertising on our shelters as well. <laughs> that's right. So Mayor, I'm a, a little bit just like some clarification from the council. We're going, if there is a change I would in make direction. A, I'd make a motion that we uh, continue the course with our current policy. Second. Second. All right, motions are made by Councilmember Bell, seen by Councilmember Blackburn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those motion passes 5 0. Item number 6. Thank you, Mayor. Item 6 is a letter of intent between the City of Greenville and Capital Broadcasting, Inc. to host a Coastal Plains baseball team at oh Guy Smith Stadium. Deputy that. City Manager. Back. Picture. Yes. Brock, go back. Show us the pictures. <laughs> no, no. Deputy City Manager <laughs> Cowan has the presentation. We'll introduce our guest. Mr. Cowan. Well. Uh, good evening. Um, based off our earlier conversation this, uh, this evening with uh, Mr. Vincent, Coach Vincent, you can see we have a long history of baseball here in Greenville and true love for the game. That's why we are excited to introduce to you tonight an opportunity to create a new future for baseball within our community, to bring a new collegiate wood bat baseball franchise to Greenville as a member of the Coastal Plain League playing at Guy Smith Stadium starting in the summer of 2024. Over the next uh, brief minutes, we will provide a very quick overview of the Coastal Plains League, capital broadcasting, the destination benefits of baseball to Greenville, an overview of the letter of intent, which we are proposing for adoption by council tonight, and the next steps. I am pleased to uh, present uh, here tonight with us is Mike Burling, the Vice President of Baseball Operations for Capital Broadcasting, and Chip Allen, Commissioner of the Coastal Plains League. Very quickly, they will provide an overview of the uh, Coastal Plain League, Capital Broadcasting, and the benefits to our local community. I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Michael. And yes, we will be quick. I, I got the hint. Um, thank you for letting us come here and, and talk a little about uh, this exciting opportunity. And, and listening to RVE, he's right. You know, people from outside Greenville, we, they are envious of, of the baseball programs, not just at ECU, but at the Babe Ruth level. I have two older kids who went through that travel ball world, and as expensive as it is and uh, um, non-inclusive as it is, uh, I, I just really getting to know RV and I just have so much re respect for what he's been able to accomplish here locally. But that's what excites us about hopefully bringing a CPL team to Greenville. Uh, so Capital Broadcasting Company, not sure how familiar everybody is with them, uh, own WRL, uh, Fox 50 in the Triangle, own the Durham Bulls, and own the Holly Springs Salamanders, which is a team in the Coastal Plain League. Well, I guess owning two teams is not good enough, so we decided to buy the entire league last October. So now we own the Coastal Plain League, of which the Holly Springs Salamanders is a team in that league. Uh, and the reason why the Goodmans did this is because they have such a passion for the game of baseball and what it can do in communities. They've, been, they've, they've seen what we've done in Durham, you know, taking the, all the area around the ballpark, the American Tobacco Campus, renovating that. It's, it's had a, a monumental impact, not only on Durham, but the entire triangle. That's the vision that they have when they think of baseball. And minor league baseball is a totally different world than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. You can't get a minor league team in a, in a, uh, in a community for under 75 to $80 million with the new standards that Major League Baseball has. We think the Coastal Plain League is that next best option. Uh, it's high-level baseball. You know, if, if you know, if you follow baseball, you have the Cape Cod League, and then you have the Coastal Plain League as kind of that next in line, uh, especially with you know, bringing in players from ECU, bringing in players from Carolina State. Uh, this is just a great thing for the community. It's, uh, it's something It's not just about the game of baseball. If you've ever been to a Bulls game, baseball is part of it, but it's also about fun. It's about bringing families out, uh, bringing companies out, so that's what we're hopefully going to um, discuss today and, and uh, answer any questions you have. But in, in the meantime, I'm going to turn it over to Chip. Chip Allen worked with me at the Bulls for approximately 10 years. Well, yeah, 10 years. And then uh, when we bought the league, we asked Chip to kind of slide over into this commissioner role of the Coastal Plain League. And we're really excited for him to kind of guide this league as we move forward with our vision. And he'll talk a little bit about the Coastal Plain League. Yeah. 
Are they both on? So 10 years in baseball is like 21 years in regular life. <laughs> so quick, kind of give you the landscape of what the league looks like in today's form. We are mostly based in North Carolina. We have three up in Virginia. We have from mountains to, to ocean. We have all the way down to, to Macon in Georgia. And we're looking to add areas that make sense. A big part of what we do is make sure that kids aren't traveling too far. And once you get into the wooden bat world, you understand travel is a big thing. And so we don't want to do any more than two and a half hours. So you won't necessarily play all the teams on this list, but you will play a, a, a group and then you'll be able to travel out and go hit some of the other ones <coughs> on any given year. Uh, this is last year's snapshot. What is, you know, what does attendance look like and, and kind of what is it, you know, what can we extrapolate from it and, and boil it down to what we can do here in Greenville? So 530,000 over 14 teams is, is a pretty good number when you think about uh, the Durham Bulls, which is AAA. I think our best year was, what, 536, 548, something like that. So those eyeballs, those number of eyeballs kind of rival that. But from an individual team, you're at 30, almost 38,000 or 1,250 per game. And so think about that is uh, what we want to do, what our vision is, is twofold. One, it's about developing players, having the, the greatest between the lines uh, that we can, but also the greatest in the stands, right? We want to, it's not one or the other. And I think uh, what makes us different is we are going to develop players. We're going to send them back to their coaches and their schools better. They've gotten more pitches, more swings. They've gotten their bats, all of those things. But we're also implementing programs where they can have strength coaches. We are about to sign a deal uh, for mental coaching, which is a big part of baseball. So it's developing that player. But then it's also developing what's happening in that stance. And I think 1250 is in this area, is, it can be very conservative. You guys have such a rich baseball history. We're not looking, we're looking to enhance, right? I, I think RV was here and we've had a really nice lunch with him. We talked about how we can work together and all the things that we can do to make baseball, because uh, there's a baseball journey. And you think about kids that are, are starting in Little League and going up and trying to get to professional, trying to get to the majors of that journey. Silver Wooden Bat is part of that journey. High School is part of that journey. Babe Ruth is part of that journey. How do we enhance? How do we bring? Uh, something to Greenville, something for the fans, but something for the players. Uh, oh, I should be talking about the CPL schedule. 24 games uh, at home, 24 games on the road. We generally do some exhibition games for each team. And so it comes out to be about 30, 32 games. Um, you can do a little bit more, you can do a little bit less. Uh, season starts end of May and goes through really the first week in August where we have playoffs and we'll have a, the, the series. I think what matters for, from, a, from a family perspective is it's something to do. And it's, you don't have to be a baseball fan. And I can tell you, working at the Bulls for 10 years, most people that came didn't care about baseball. They liked it. It was nice what was going on, but it was all those other things. It was a community. It's where you got to see each other. You got to see your fans, and there was little pods uh, where, where people uh, met and knew each other. Holly Spring Salamanders, which we own, uh, I, I think it was one of the first years we bought it, and I was interviewing people to come work, and I said, well, first question, why do you want to work here? Well, this is where everybody comes to get together. This is where you want to be seen. I said, wow, okay, that's pretty fantastic. That's part of being part of the community. And that's what I think these teams have the power to do. This is minor league baseball three decades ago. This is where it's fun. It's a lot of fun, and it's engaging, and it's great on the field, and it's great in the stands. Uh, so I think I hit a lot of these numbers. 1250 per game is, is kind of what we think is, is, is an average that we go for. I think we can do more than that. But when we put a team here, what else can come along with it? And there's a lot of things that this opens up to. All-star games, uh, other events, other teams coming in uh, to play the CPL. It's how can we help Babe Ruth? How can we you know, support them? And, and what can we do to, to make them a better organization? If, if I mean, they're pretty darn good. So. But what can we enhance with them, right? It's all about, and we don't have those answers, but the reality is we want to be here. We want to be a partner with Greenville. We want to be a partner with Babe Ruth and RV. And we just such a great history. It's hard not to get excited. Some people you might have heard of, these folks have all come through the CPL. Uh, I, think, I think we had three this year that have been uh, made their first appearance at MLB level. 
uh, which is pretty impressive and a lot of fun. And then you might, you should certainly recognize one of these guys on here. <laughs> but UNC head coach, Duke head coach. The CPL has a long history of helping people through their baseball journey. And that's what we're a part of. Uh, players, they come from all schools. A lot of them come from D1. This is a very competitive program. It depends on how you rank these things. You can say the CPL is a top three wooden bat league. And we can argue over who's where and what. And, but it's, it's a great league, and we're looking to you know, grow that, enhance that, um, and get better at it. Marketing efforts, uh, part of what we do is, is we come in and we make sure that people know that we're here. It's, it's kind of like nobody's coming over to your house unless you invite them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always our strategy is to make sure people know that we're here and be part of it. Welcome them in, welcome everybody in. It, it's, it's important that the community uh, is represented there and that's how we go after it. Promotions, uh, that's a big part of baseball. If you've been to any minor league baseball games, it's kind of what makes it fun. It's uh, be wide open. So we will continue doing those things. Mascots are a big part of it. It's the show, right? It's a show beyond the lines. And we're, and I'll say Mike's been doing this for 20 something, 25 years, 28, 30, 40. And it's, it's incredible how much fun you can have and how creative you can be for great family entertainment and people can come out. And that's what, we, that's what we've done at the Bulls, that's what we've done at Holly Springs, and that's what we'll continue to do, is grow that entertainment, make it fun, get the input from the, from the market and the fans and, and, and go from there. Mike, you wanna talk about field requirements? Uh, well, I think you probably have seen. So we are, uh, as part of this deal, we will put in $500,000 to try to um, fix, guys, not fix, but, that's what I love about it. It's so historical. What can we do to enhance? How do we get to 1,250? Well, we need more seats. Right now, the capacity is a little under 1,000. So that's are some of the things we're looking at uh, that we'll have to do. And we've already talked with RV. We absolutely want to talk with RV. What are some things that we can do to, uh, in this renovation to help his program? Um, so those are all things that we're hoping to look at as part of this renovation. And we're hoping to have opening day end of May of 2024. Andrew? <coughs> um, so just want to touch basically on the destination benefits of bringing a CPL team to Greenville. Um, I love the map here. I love where the teams are. So it, it kind of gives us as tourism people uh, the best of both worlds. You've got a lot of teams that I think can enhance what we like to call backyard tourism, which is our tourism that's maybe an hour and a half away that doesn't necessarily need to come in and stay overnight, but it's going to come in and eat in the restaurants and shop and create sales tax revenue. But we do have some teams, I think, far enough away that would stay. Um, but in any case, you have parents that are going to be following these players that I think are going to stay, family members. Um, certainly, I think there's some scouts from time to time that may show uh, up to watch some of these games. So. Um, you know, I think we're going to see increased IPC tax revenue with some heads and beds, but also increased sales tax revenue for the city. <coughs> uh, the thing I'll also get excited about is the exposure that our destination is going to get um, from having a team if we decide to put a team here. People coming here to Greenville for the first time and being exposed to the growth that Greenville Pitt County is experiencing and then coming back for a weekend when there's not a game. So getting them here more than just one time. Um, I think it raises our destination profile as a destination that has to compete with other destinations. Being able to support a CPL team here, having a CPL team here, says a lot about the community that it's in. Um, very excited about the partnership and what may happen to Guy Smith Stadium, um, upgrading it, and maybe that leads to some other sports stores and opportunities that we may be able to bring, as well as the uh, revenue from CPL games as well. Special event opportunities. Um, I'm holding these guys to an all-star game. Love to have an all-star game here. That would be really great for our community. Um, but also just think about, you know, the non-tourism aspects of it, the residents. This is a resident amenity as well. So the people that live here are going to have another reason to love Greenville um, by having a team here. And I think it's also, you know, from, from a different perspective, maybe a, a workforce development tool because you have to sell the city and tourism to bring meeting and convention planners here. Um, you have to sell the city to bring economic development. And for us, from the tourism side, this will be an excellent amenity to say, you know, what else can we do while we're here for our convention at meeting or our sports tournament? 
well, let's go to a CPL game. Let's go see the Greenville team. Um, so to us, as far as our board's concerned, it's a win for the city, and we think there's a lot of destination benefits that are going to take place if we do have a CPL team here. So I'll hand it over to Michael. Thank you, Andrew. So how do we make this happen? Well, we start with the letter of intent, which is a non-binding agreement between the city and Capital Broadcasting that outlines the proposed lease of Guy Smith Stadium for CPL games and activities. It represents the terms uh, necessary to continue discussions and negotiations. And with approval of the letter of intent here tonight by council, it will take us to the next step to start negotiating out a lease that we can bring back to you. The letter of intent includes the fact that Capital would bring a loca locate a Coastal Plain League franchise team here in Greenville. It will lease Guy Smith Stadium between May 15th and September 30th of each year for a 10-year period, starting out, starting out at a year one lease of $30,000 and increasing 2% each year during the term of the lease, playing between 30 and 32 games each year starting in June of 2024. Also included in this is a million dollars worth of improvements to Gossman Stadium, $500,000 funded by capital and $500,000 funded by the city through the CVA capital fund. The city and capital would partner to determine what the actual improvements to the stadium would be, with the primary goal of increasing the capacity to approximately 1,500. Right now it stands at about 1,000. And also adding seating down the first base and third base line and all improvements would become the property of the city. For all CPO games and activities, capital will be responsible for the concessions, obtain the ABC license for serving beverages, any damages to the, uh, to the stadium, cleanup of concessions and locker rooms, providing security, the cost of any extraordinary field improvements, as well as operating the scoreboard and the public address system. The city would be responsible for the cleaning up of the stands and the bathrooms, utilities, the field prep, and the ongoing routine maintenance of the stadium as we currently do. Now, Capital and the city both understand the importance of community and also of teaching the love of baseball to our local youth. That's why during each year of the term of the lease, the city and Capital work together to provide a one-day baseball camp for the benefit of West Greenville youth operated by the coaches and players of the Greenville Coastal Plains League franchise, and the camp will be structured around skill development, character building, and developing a love of baseball. We also have heard here tonight how we value a partnership with our local Babe Ruth group. Babe Ruth has consistently been a home of the, of Guy Smith has been the home of our Babe Ruth program and will continue to be in the future. So there will be a sharing of the field during certain months of the year. And we have a commitment through this letter of intent that both Capital and Brave Ruth will work together to make sure that the games are scheduled so that Guy Smith Stadium will continue to be the home field of the Babe Ruth program. We're also looking within the letter of intent to coordinate a fundraiser for the sole benefit of the Babe Ruth program in partnership between the city, Capital, and Babe Ruth and what I like the most is the ability within this LOI to offer at least two spots on the roster each year on the local franchise team for players that previously had played, collegiate players that had previously played within the Babe Ruth program. That means that families will be able to see their players within their hometown on a summer when they're home from college, which would be an outstanding opportunity, not only for those families, but also for fans who have grown up seeing those players play within our local high schools. So what are the next steps? Well, first of all, it goes with the adoption of the letter of intent here tonight. And with that letter of intent adoption, we would move forward with a lease agreement at the May 11th uh, council meeting under a public hearing. At that point in time, we would also begin to move forward with stadium improvements and renovations between the months of May through June of next year, all looking forward to an opening day in June of 2024. This is an opportunity that this city has looked forward to for a long time, to bring a higher level of baseball to our community, to <coughs> complement that with what we have within our youth programs and our ECU Pirates. 
And I think this is, provides the, the perfect opportunity to not only improve our facilities, provide that opportunity for our community to see a high level baseball during the summer months. And that, we would all be glad to take any questions. Mr. Mayor, are you happy with all these base runners? Yes. <laughs> any questions? Yes. Councilman Daniels. The letter of intent. <clears throat> so for the youth of West Greenville, of course, I think Jackie Robinson. And <coughs> there are several teams with Jackie Robinson, <coughs> which I think a day would not be enough. Okay. So can we get that extended? Well, that would be in a compliment to the programs that we all already offer to our, our West Greenville community youth. We already provide uh, camps um, that are free to those students. This would be in addition to that as well. Right, but even in, in addition to, this sounds like a great opportunity mm -hmm. and something that the kids, an ex, a different type of experience from what our camps would give them. Yeah. And that sure. would definitely take more than one day. Well, and then I would have to ask for the, um, the, the Coastal Plain League and Capital to answer that. Yeah, so what you think of a 24 game season, they're, they're pretty much on, if, if we're not playing at home, we're on the road. So when we do camps in Holly Springs, it's, you know, it's a two month period. When we do camps, we have one or two one day camps. It's not something where we can do multiple days because they're, they're always playing. So you know, I think there's other things we can do to support the Jackie Robinson program. Um, in fact, in Durham, we have, a, we have our own Durham Bulls Youth Athletic League that is, um, you know, we have three, 400 kids that are soccer, basketball, baseball. So we, we have a history of doing this. I, I don't want to, you know, when we come here, we're going to want to be as ingrained in, in whatever baseball program we, because that, that's, it's, it's a smart thing to do, honestly. Yeah. You know, and, the, and the growing the game of baseball is important. Yeah, I, I believe that, of my personal opinion, there should not be anything in Greenville that every child in Greenville does not is not a part of. Right. Um, and so I understand what you're saying. I just want to make sure that all of our children have I the hear opportunity you. to Absolutely. experience that. Okay. And I think uh, we have proven that as a city that we will do everything we can to provide opportunities for baseball camps for those students for those mm -hmm. players mm -hmm. within the Jackie Robinson League and this is only adds to complement that. Okay. Any other questions? Councilmember Blackburn? The mayor's probably going to want to take me to school on this one, but uh, there's two spots open for um, members who have previously played in the Babe Ruth. And I just was curious, Babe Ruth, I, I guess Jackie Robinson cuts off at a certain age, is that right? Yes. Okay. And these are collegiate players. These okay. are not just players that have once played uh, in the Babe Ruth program. These are called, this team is made up of college players, the, the Coastal Plain League franchise teams. So they would only allow players that are actually in college to play on their team. And these would be team players in college that, had, that are previously played within the Babe Ruth program. Okay. Yeah, we, we have to abide by the NCAA rules of, that kind of govern the summer league baseball. So the, these players would have to be playing for a college in order for us to take them on the team. I guess sort of continuing Councilmember Daniels' um, questions, I, I hope that this program is able to um, support and um, incorporate as much as possible our Jackie Robinson folks because. And let me just say that this, uh, this program will be located within West Greenville. And let's look at the opportunity for the youth within West Greenville to actually take uh, participation in higher level baseball. How many of those kids actually get to go to, to ECU games? How many get to go to major league games? How many get to go to Durham Bull games? These games, the Coastal Plain League games will be in the backyard with West Greenville and the children that play within the Jackie Robinson League. And let's look at what the cost of those tickets are. The cost of these tickets are what, five to 10 bucks. You will not find a more affordable opportunity for children to see higher level baseball at a very affordable price than the Coastal Plain League opportunities right here. And I do have one more sorry. question. I'm one sorry. One other thing, there's, there's some really cool opportunities. We do a lot of field of dreams. And so as when the leagues or uh, Jack Robinson League would come out and players would then go out on the field and accompany the, all the, the position players as the starting lineup. And so we can do programs like that that incorporate and get them involved and they get to come out and be part of that night. And there's, I tell you, I've seen this a thousand times, these kids get to go out with the center fielder, stand with them, and uh, <coughs> the national anthem, it is the highlight. It is the highlight for them. And those are the kind of things that we will do. 
that we want to do, and that helps bring those kids to be part of this team. Thank you. And my last question uh, has actually uh, come from someone in the public who uh, just wants to make sure that for the neighborhoods nearby with these additional games that they won't be that, that there won't be any negative effects for them and I guess that responsibility is going to more fall on the city is that just a matter that, of and that is no different from already the games that we play on a nightly basis if you look at the Gossman Stadium it's already used significantly for Jade Rose baseball as well as for uh, Babe Ruth baseball during the, the summer this will not change the use of the stadium or exacerbate any issues uh, for the community. And, and we, we have league rules also that determine how late you can play once it gets, because remember, a lot of these kids, they're driving back to their, their home that night. So we, we don't play late into the evening. You know, games start at 7. We're usually done by 10, 1030 at the latest. Thank you. Any other questions? No, there's, uh, there's been a lot of positive feedback on this online that I've seen. Uh, the community seems really excited about it. I would just say, uh, you know, I have seen a lot of comments about wanting to kind of secure the historical integrity of that stadium. So if we could keep that in mind as we make these improvements, that would be great. But with that said, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. Yes. All right, motion been made by Councilmember Bell, second by Councilmember Robinson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Item number seven. Thank you, Mayor. On item seven is the fiscal year 22 23 third quarter general fund financial update and a preview of the city of Greenville fiscal year 23 24 proposed budget. Just to let the council know, this is really a high level view of the council budget, and um, you'll get a more in depth view of the presented budget on May the 8th. Financial Services Director Byron Hayes has the presentation. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this is the proposed third quarter financial update in 2024 uh, budget draft for the year. Um, just to remind the Council of the city's mission statement as well as the Council's goals for the um, upcoming year. Um, I do want to just go over a brief overview of the type of funds that we do have in our operating uh, ordinance for the year. So first we're going to start with the general fund. The general fund is our largest and main operating fund of the organization. Um, this current year the budget was roughly $95 million. Uh, next year it is proposed at about $101.5 million. Uh, we also have enterprise funds. That's our transit, our stormwater, and our solid waste fund. Uh, those are funds that are funded with user fees and or grants, um, and those funds operate uh, their operations like a business. Um, or this current year, it's roughly $20 million. Next year, it'll be roughly um, $24.7 uh, million. Uh, we also have our internal service funds. That's our fleet, our VRF, our FIP, and our health fund. Um, those are funded with transfers or payments from other funds, and they're used to track specific operational expenses. Um, this year and next year, it's roughly about $25 million. And lastly, our debt service fund, which is funded with transfers from other funds, which is used to track our debt service payments uh, for the organization. Um, last, or this current year, it's roughly $6.3 million. Uh, next year, it'll be roughly six point eight. Um, so to go into the third quarter financial update, uh, first talking about the general fund, um, the assumptions that we used in order to um, form our projections for the year, projections are based on five, year, um, uh, five years of data for our expenses and our revenues. Um, we do have no non-essential spending after May 15th, that's our purchasing cutoff, and we do continue to make 100% of our budgeted transfers. Um, our projected summary, uh, our revenues are expected to exceed the expenses by roughly $2.8 million for the um, 2023 year. And looking at the revenues, um, as I said, uh, $101.6 million of projected revenue for the current fiscal year. Um, just a couple of the um, couple of the, the categories. Our sales tax um, is projected to exceed budget by roughly $3 million, uh, mainly due to inflationary. Um, issues that, that we're seeing. Um, and our investment earnings are expected to exceed uh, the budget by roughly about $2 million. And that's just due to higher interest rates. Um, looking at the expenses, um, our personnel expense for the year is expected to exceed budget by roughly $1.4 million. However, we did anticipate that. Um, that's mainly due to um, really positive uh, performance evaluations from our employees as well as um, uh, the funding of a, or the partial funding of the uh, pay study for the current year. Um, uh, in addition to that, our operations are expected to be under budget by about two and a half million dollars, and that's mainly due to supply chain issues that we've been seeing for the current fiscal year. Um, so just again to summarize, uh, revenues are expected to exceed expenses by about $2.8 million. 
Um, moving on to our enterprise funds, um, our sanitation fund is expected, uh, the expenses are expected to exceed our revenues by about um, a little bit under $100,000. Our stormwater uh, fund expenses are expected to exceed revenues by about $1.3 million. However, that was uh, anticipated just due to the increased, um, uh, the increased services that we are providing due to, um, as a result of the stormwater plan that was um, approved by council uh, back in 2019. And our transit fund is expected, uh, expenses are expected to exceed revenues by about $200,000. And that is due to the timing of our um, grant draws for the current fiscal year. Um, looking at our internal service funds as well as our debt service fund, uh, I do want to point out um, the vehicle replacement fund is, and the expenses are expected to exceed revenues by about $2 million. That is due to, um, uh, us catching up with our vehicle purchases. We had vehicles that were ordered in previous fiscal years. However, due to supply chain issues, we're just now receiving those and just now paying for those vehicles. Um, and looking at our debt service fund, uh, within the debt service fund, it's about $6.2 million projected for the year. And within our business type uh, funds, we see about another $2 million. So roughly about $8.5 million worth of debt service uh, that the city is projected to pay this year. Um, so just looking at factors that are impacting the budget, um, we do have inflationary concerns for uh, goods and services, and we are continuing to monitor our fleet charges, um, and as well as the price of fuel. We have seen those go up uh, pretty significantly for the current fiscal year. Um, we are still monitoring the changes in our year in receivables. Uh, as sales tax increases, that does uh, cause the receivable to go up. Um, however, with uh, us catching up on uh, the billing for our uh, EMS bills, um, that is causing our receivable to go down a little bit. So it does offset it a little bit. Um, with the supply chain issues that we're seeing, we do um, see some increased encumbrances for the year just from items that we're going to purchase that will not be received in the current fiscal year. And um, I do want to point out that even though we have seen a pretty significant increase in our interest rates um, and our investment income for the current fiscal year, those numbers are still volatile and we are still monitoring those. Um, so looking at the uh, proposed budget for the 2024 year, uh, just a couple of highlights. Um, we are still maintaining the tax rate at 48.95 cents. Uh, we are increasing the pavement management program from 2.8 to $2.9 million. And um, we are including a 2% uh, 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 merit market increase in the current fiscal year for employees, as well as funding the uh, remaining uh, a full year of the compensation study. Uh, we funded the six months uh, this current year, so we're funding a full year next year. Um, we do have a new department, the Neighborhood and Business Services Department, uh, that we are adding to the budget this year, um, which does include a couple of, uh, or excuse me, an additional support position. And we do also have some additional positions uh, to help fund some additional amenities at Wildwood. And lastly, we are continuing the stormwater plan that council approved back in 2019. Um, the uh, proposed budget is $101.5 million, revenues and expenses, the budget's balance. And uh, as you can see, $101.5 million next year as compared to $95 million in the current fiscal year. Um, as you can see, our tax rate has continuously gone down over the course of the past 22 years now. Um, still at 48.95 or uh, 48.95 cents for the current fiscal year. Um, even with that tax rate decreasing, our property tax uh, total has continued to go up. Uh, we're anticipating it to go up um, just under 4.5% for next year, which is due to just increased growth within the city. Uh, additionally, our sales tax revenue is continuing to grow up while it has gone up pretty significantly uh, in the past three to five years. Um, we are uh, being rather, uh, rather conservative with our uh, budgeted growth rate for next year, roughly about 2%, just due to um, any potential um, uh, recessionary concerns that we might have. Um, and just with, ex as the same with revenues, our expenses uh, for next year, $101.5 million as compared to $95 million for this current fiscal year. Um, some of our personnel expense um, uh, inclusions for this current fiscal year, two point, uh, a 2% 2 uh, wage increase for the year, um, as well as a full um, year's worth of the compensation study included. 1.2% uh, increase in our employer share of the uh, retirement contribution, as well as a 5% vacancy rate that's included in the budget this year. Our current vacancy rate is, is approximately 10%, and so it's going to be our policy moving forward um, that we budget a vacancy rate, roughly half of our um, current vacancy rate at the time. 
Um, looking at the transfers, uh, $13.8 million in transfers for next year's budget. Uh, the largest of that is our debt service transfer, um, roughly $6.8 million. And that number does include some additional funding for our build grant, um, our potential build grant issuance that we are anticipating um, having happen next year. Uh, looking at our enterprise funds, our sanitation fund uh, is increasing to $9.2 million as compared to about 8.3 from uh, the previous year. Uh, stormwater is increasing to um, just under $12 million, also including um, an additional $2 million in fund balance just to um, in, be able to continue the enhanced services that we're providing as a part of the plan. And our transit fund has a modest increase to about $3.7 million for next year's budget. Um, our internal service funds, I uh, do want to point out in our internal service funds that the vehicle replacement fund is actually decreasing um, some from uh, the previous or from the current fiscal year. This is due to um, our side loader leases within our sanitation fund, uh, redirecting some of that funding that normally went into the, uh, the vehicle replacement fund will now be paid for from the sanitation fund. Um, and our debt service fund, as I stated earlier, is going from $6.3 million this current fiscal year to $6.8 million. Uh, looking at some of the capital projects that we have in the current budget, um, or next year's budget rather, um, it has been updated to include some of the changes that we've seen with the build grant as well as the uh, ARPA funding that we've received. Um, and that those current CIP projects uh, throughout all of our funds will uh, be roughly about $47.5 million for, the current, or for next fiscal year. Um, Additionally, do you want to look at the entire plan as a whole, $236.5 million. However, about $88 million, or roughly 37%, is unfunded, um, and that funding has not been identified for those projects in, those five -year in that five-year period. Um, looking at next steps, uh, we will have the city's budget presentation on May 8th, as well as the other entity budget presentations on May 11th. Uh, we'll have the public hearing and the budget adoption in June. Any questions? Any questions for Ms. Hayes? All right. Nope. All right. That's it. That's it. All right. Move on to city manager's report. Oh, so we, do we make do we make a motion of this? Mm -hmm. No. no. That's that was just a presentation. I'd, I'd like to add something to our conversation about the budget. It doesn't uh, necessarily involve uh, kind of the 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 level which you pre pre presented, which was the very high level. But I've spoken with um, some other members of council, and I hope when we do get to that sort of line item level that um, we can find um, a little bit of money for Eastside Park. I know that we have a lot of needs and a lot of demands on our budget. And um, Eastside Park has been a part of our city since 1999, and um, it's been part of our master parks plan since 2008. And, um, I, I would like for us to um, include a, a little bit of money, perhaps between five to ten thousand dollars, for some park benches and some trail signs. Doesn't even sort of rise to the level of CIP or council action. It's just something that I've been speaking with other members of council about, and um, it, it would be really great to see that in our budget. Even though we have a lot of other pressure, I think that even though we have a lot of pressure and a lot of demands, it shouldn't sort of cause us not to have vision and we've approved so much new development out in that area we have so much new growth and there's so many families out there now and um, I know a farmer still leases the land and grows soybeans out there so whatever we did we don't want to interfere with the farmer but I'm thinking you know $500 park benches that we could put out on those farm ponds again something along the lines of five to ten thousand dollars not a large line item Thank Councilor you. Smiley. What's the contingency? Um, you guys usually have a $200,000 or so contingency in these budgets. Is that? So it's it's $100,000. What? Uh, uh, it's $100,000 okay. for next year's budget. Okay. Any other questions, comments? City manager's report. I have no report, Mayor. Councilmember Daniels. Uh, first, I want to wish a happy seventh birthday to my grandson, J.C. Young. Um, he has also lost two teeth this week. Um, I told him, don't worry about it, he gets them back. Um, you know, we're the ones that don't. <laughs> um, also, to remind everybody that Wednesday is Administrative Assistance Day. Don't forget the ones that keep our um, companies running. And to also give a special shout out and congratulations to Ms. Tiana Berryman, 
our newest um, director of neighborhood and business services. Well deserved. Congratulations. Have to start coming to council. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Councilmember Blackburn. I would like to echo that congratulations to Tiana. Very happy for her. Just like to say um, thank you to everyone who made our Earth Day celebration so fantastic this year. Mm -hmm. Really big event and lots of people came out for it lots of good vegan food so thank you everyone who took part of that and organizing it and making it a success councilmember smiley no comments councilmember bell no comments councilmember robinson thank you mr mayor i would like to say that uh, i was unable to attend the meeting that had the tennis court and pickleball folks here because i was sick and, and actually had to have surgery tomorrow because of that but in, in listening to all that, and I've got friends on both sides of that argument, and then going to the dedication for RV, and now hearing this wonderful news about the baseball uh, Coastal Plains League coming here. Um, one of the things that I started with when I wanted to come here was to make Greenville a destination city. And one of the things that I think the CPO is going to be is for somebody to do something after 5 o'clock. When you get off from your job, what do you do? And maybe instead of going to the beach or going somewhere else, you stay here and go see a baseball game. And it's a great way to develop the west side of Greenville and have youth on that side of Greenville, but not just there, but all youth be able to see a professional style baseball game for, you know, just a few dollars. I mean, even to go to an ECU baseball game is much more expensive than that. So I'm excited, but that leads me to my long winded comment. Um, the city of Greenville, needs and the county needs a sports complex we need one it would be an awesome amenity and i think there's a lot of interest out there on the county side and i like to think our city side and um, i think there's even some interest in ecu side so i hope this would be a segue into some very serious conversations about doing that so we can add more amenities because at the end of the day when young people come here i want them to come here not just for a job but because of the amenities that we uh, can offer them and right now we're few and far between like that after five o'clock this baseball is going to be great and then it leads us into the next thing is once we get that then we move on to the arts and councils and other things that uh, can truly make us a destination city as i said to ann wallace she remembers it and, and i was joking but serious that i was tired of riding in the caboose of, of the train of progress i want us to be at the front on the engine leading forward and so um you know, from controversy come sometimes some good things. So the controversy that kind of started this tennis and pickleball, I hope it will lead us all as council members in the city of Greenville into a conversation about maybe a sports complex to put here in, in the city of Greenville with partnering with the county and maybe ECU and even some private investors to make that happen. And then keep moving forward on that train. And instead of moving in the caboose, we actually start to be at the front of the train. And so those are my comments. Again, what a wonderful uh, honor to go to, to Coach Vincent, and I really meant he is a coach of uh, young boys, turning them into men, because I can tell you how many people he has coached into men, aside from the baseball program. So I think it's, uh, it was a wonderful honor to have him. Finally, I know I'm talking too long because another mayor wants to get somewhere. Uh, good luck to everybody in their exams as they approach in the school year and also college. Everybody study hard and good luck and make all A's. So, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to make his comments. All right. Thank you very much. No comment for me. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So Second. moved. Second. Motion been made by Council Member Blackburn. Second by Council Member Robinson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Let's pass 5-0. We're adjourned.